everybody. My name is Liz Weaver, and I'm the co-CEO of the Tamarack Institute, where I lead the Tamarack Learning Center. In today's webinar, as uh, Duncan mentioned, we'll be exploring the Collective Impact Forum's Collective Impact Feasibility Framework, a useful approach for considering the nature of the problem being tackled and the community preconditions which are essential to collective impact efforts. Joining me today for this discussion is FSG's Director of Programs, Robert Albright. I'm going to um, now introduce you to Robert. Uh, Robert and I have worked together as co-catalysts around the collective impact issue for a number of years now. Robert brings knowledge and expertise and experience in collective impact across a range of issue areas, including economic development, education, and health. As Director of Programs at FSG, Robert leads the Funder Community of Practice for the Collective Impact Forum an initiative of FSG and the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions. Robert has conducted various workshops and spoken at local, regional, and national convenings on collective impact. Prior to joining the Collective Impact Forum, Robert led numerous consulting engagements with FSG, including a collective impact project focused on economic competitiveness in Ohio, the development of a strategic learning and evaluation system for Women's Health Foundation in Texas, a retrospective evaluation for a healthcare for healthcare access in Florida, and a year-long project to improve an urban school district's academic outcomes and fiscal sustainability. Wow, quite a mix of projects that you've been involved in, Robert. Other recent <laughs> clients include Melinda Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation. Um, the National Summer Learning Association, and the Rockefeller Foundation. So, uh, Robert, we're very pleased that you could join us today. Thanks, Liz. It's great to be on the line with you and with everyone else dialing in, and really appreciate the invitation. So I've given everybody a bit of a background on you, um, but I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your role at the Collective Impact Forum and maybe also some of the priorities that you and the forum have been working on recently. Sure, I'm happy to take just a few minutes on this, and um, maybe as, as part of the about the forum, I'll also share some of the common questions we're getting, many of which we'll, we'll, we'll touch on today. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with the Collective Impact Forum, we're a field-building partnership between FSG and the Aspen Institute focused on accelerating the pace of um, of uh, collective impact uh, efforts around not only the U.S. and Canada, but, but increasingly around the world. And we're grateful for Tamarack's partnership and others that you can see on the bottom of this slide who've really been um, close fall partners of ours <clears throat> as the forum has grown over the last four years. And the forum essentially provides an online and in-person meeting ground for collective impact funders and backbone leaders and other practitioners to access tools and resources to do their work better. Um, the, the other part of your question that you asked, Liz, about some of the priorities that I've been working on recently, I'd say they, they fall into two big buckets. There's a, a category of questions, lots of questions that we get from the field around kind of getting started with collective impact, which I would say this session today certainly falls squarely in that um, bucket of priorities. So how do we know that collective impact is the right approach? What are some of those kind of readiness factors, which we'll talk about today? So that's certainly one key priority. I'd say the second is there, we, we get a lot of questions around the how-to of collective impact, and I think we'll certainly dig into some of those today as well. Uh, but this is often from folks who might be um, a, a year or two or more into the work, and they're having questions about um, evaluating collective impact or um, adaptive leadership or equity and community engagement or sustaining momentum. So uh, uh, that just gives you a little tip of the iceberg of some of the questions we're getting right now where we're you know, designing both in-person and, and virtual learning opportunities, either in partnership with you all or with others in the field. So really excited about today's conversation. So um, before we get into the feasibility framework, can you just remind us a little bit about um, collective impact um, and its uh, it it as a framework for community change. Sure, happy to, and hopefully this is uh, not new news for for most of you on the line. But for those of you who might be new to the concept, I'll just take a, a minute in response to Liz's question about defining what is collective impact, and, and really the collective impact concept builds on really decades of research and practice from from lots of, of folks who've been studying comprehensive community change, and it was. Two of my colleagues at FSG who in 2011 coined the term collective impact, which really tried to put a 
set of principles and, and common language in place for what we had seen and what others had seen really gets to, um, to, 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 to change at scale when you're bringing multiple folks together uh, to, to partner. So we define collective impact as a commitment of a group of important actors from different sectors to a common agenda for addressing a specific complex problem at scale. And in a minute, I'll talk a little bit about what are some of those key building blocks of collective impact. But I would say collective impact does not equal every form of collaboration. I would say it, it is not necessarily needed as an approach in every instance. But when you're trying to bring together multiple sectors, public, private, nonprofit, we're really trying to address a complex issue. We found from uh, across lots of different issue areas that this is an approach well, when structured properly uh, that can really lead to, to impressive results. So let's just, I'll share briefly um, as a reminder for you all, what are those five key elements of collective impact? And these were the five elements that were originally introduced in the, the 2011 article that we've built upon and Tamarack and others have built upon over the years, which has been great to see how the field has, has evolved and pushed our thinking, frankly. Uh, but I would say these are the five key elements to keep in mind. But if you have these in place, uh, you can you can get to, to transformative uh, change when working across multiple partners. So first is a common agenda where you not only understand what the problem is that you're trying to address, but that you have a shared uh, vision or roadmap for what, what the future will look like by working together. Second is a shared measurement system where you are not only uh, collecting data, but you're learning from it, you're adapting based on the information that's coming in, you have a you have a system in place or a, a process for gathering data and learning from it. Third is mutually reinforcing activities where it's not about everyone doing the same thing. It's about having visibility into what each partner is doing and you've got a, a joint plan of action to, to, to see that your efforts are really um, adding up to something that's much greater than than each organization doing its own thing. Fourth is continuous communication, where you're focusing on um, ways of building trust among partners. This is also where you think about how to uh, prioritize bringing in the voice of those with lived experience who are so critical to this work and ultimately why we are focusing on complex problem solving is that we ultimately want to see our community strengthen. So what are ways that you're um, bringing other voices into the work, not just for feedback, but for, for co-ownership and, and developing strategies? And then lastly, backbone support, we spend a lot of time at the Collective Impact Forum thinking about this role and how we can support those who are um, playing this role or want to play this role, but it, but it's the facilitation, the data analysis, uh, um, the uh, keeping the eye on communication and engagement. It's not solely driving the work forward at all, but it definitely is a critical role to help thinking about the health of the collaborative and structuring conversations so that you can distribute leadership and ownership among partners. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of the overview of the approach. And oftentimes when people see these concepts, they say, well, this makes a lot of sense. And for a lot of people, they would say, well, I see my work already in a lot of these elements. And, and that's the one last thing I'd say on this question, Liz, is that I don't feel like collective impact is necessarily counterintuitive um, in its concept, but it is counterculture cultural and its implementation, meaning that it's hard to actually um, keep all, all of these five elements um, in place across multiple partners over a long period of time. So that's where I feel like the secret sauce is, is you can prioritize these elements and recognize that it's going to take multiple organizations working together. It's, it's where there's there's a lot of power and potential. Yeah, and, you know, I, I totally agree with you, Robert. Um, we're going to actually uh, maybe take one step um, backwards um, and really talk about, you know, entering into this, right, entering into this framework in terms of the collective impact feasibility framework. And so um, last year, the forum launched the collective impact feasibility framework. I wonder if you can walk us through it, because it's almost like that, that saying, you know, you start as you mean to go. Um, and so I think, you know, while this is the core of the framework, how do we, how do communities that are thinking about entering into this work, um, what are some of the, the things that they need to consider? Sure, I'm ha happy to do that. And this is on your screen, but we can also, maybe as a follow-up, as we can share this, there's a, um, a resource that walks through this framework in more detail. But basically what's distilled on this slide, and it's certainly busy, but I'll, I'll try and break it down uh, for you all into four key questions. You can almost think of this as a decision tree of sorts that 
you know, comprehensive uh, community change, collective impact type work is never a linear process. So this makes it look like, oh, if you just answer these four questions, you can, you can, you know, hit hit go and and start your collective impact effort. We know that this work often is goes and fits and starts, and you, you might not go through a very linear process. But these are some questions that you might have already been thinking about or should be thinking about when deciding is collective impact both the appropriate approach or or you know kind of tool or or uh, uh, structure to use. So that's the first important question that, that this um, framework helps un- understand. And then the second big question is around readiness. So a lot of times people will go straight into, are we as a community ready for collective impact without first stepping back and saying, well, is it actually the right approach? And so when you look at these four questions, really questions one, two, and three help you get at the, the, the kind of questions that come even before asking, are we ready? Um, and sometimes we find that people um, forget to, to think through questions one, two, and three, and they jump straight into, well, do we have the elements in place to, to, to you know, form a cross-sector collaborative? So let me just talk through each of these four questions. Again, questions one, two, and three are more around, is collective impact appropriate? And then the last one is more around readiness. So, of course, first, you need to spend some time with you and your partners thinking about, like, what is the specific social problem that we're focusing on? Sometimes... Folks may start with a really broad definition of, well, we want to work on educational attainment, but sometimes it can be helpful to be much more specific about where in that pipeline. And then a second important question is, are there multiple actors in the system who could influence this problem? If it's something where maybe one or two nonprofits could actually address the issue head on and may not need to bring together multiple sectors, then collective impact is probably not the right approach. You could just think of a really effective partnership between two organizations. But if it does require government and nonprofits and philanthropy, then that kind of brings you down to this blue box of of the questions around, is collective impact the most appropriate solution? Within that, there's, there's several things to think about. So one, is the system fragmented or broken? So do you have a disconnect between maybe health and education systems? Is there a, a poor handoff from kids as they go from elementary into to middle school? Um, do you need multiple actors to address this issue uh, or multiple sectors? So maybe not just education, but education and health. And is this something that actually impacts a sizable you know, share of the population such that you would need to bring a level of kind of structure and rigor to the work? So once you get through that top half of the slide and those key questions and you're answering yes to those, then you really get to this bottom row, which we'll talk about in more detail. So for the sake of time, I won't walk through these in detail but right now, but, but really it's four things, these, these readiness factors. So are there influential champions? Do you have committed resources? Is there some level of uh, trust and history of collaboration? And, and what's the urgency for change? So if you can kind of clear those hurdles and answer yes to all of those, then you can answer the yes, it's appropriate as an approach, and yes, that we are ready as a community to to really move forward on collective impact as, as something we want to use as a, as a process for change. I think this is a really helpful framework in terms of, you know, trying to understand the issue in its uh, complexity and then to kind of think about is this the right approach and then also to think about then is our community ready, right? Because it is um, it is a structured approach, as you've mentioned. Can you maybe share with us an example or so of when a group has used this framework and what some of the outcomes might have been? Yeah, I'm happy to and um, I would love to as we get towards the Q&A part as well for folks who have questions, but also maybe a, a comment about how you've seeing these questions play out in your work, I'd be interested to hear. And Duncan, I know you can play that that back uh, with with for, for Liz and I's reference and for the group's reference later. But I'll share two examples that kind of uh, represent uh, two different communities that were actually focused on the same issue um, that went through a process of, of reflecting on those questions and actually ended up in different places. So it might help people understand how you could use this um, this set of questions and this framework to to decide, yes, we think that collective impact as, as an approach could could work well for our community. So the first example I'll give you, and, and again, both of these are, I'll, I'll change the names of the cities to protect the innocent, but these were two different cities in California that were both um, interested in addressing preterm birth as, a, as an issue area. So they, they you know, uh, were clear about the specific issue. They were clear about the specific geography 
But when they started getting into the questions about appropriateness and readiness, um, they actually ended up in different places. So I'll, I'll first give you the example of the community that, that ended up with answering yes to all of those questions that I had just presented. So this was a, a community where they had a preterm birth rate of 11%. It was above the state average. It was um, They clearly had um, identified it was an issue that was urgent, that um, impacted a sizable swath of the population. Um, they recognized that, that there was the need to better connect different systems. And there really were several local champions who had voluntarily emerged to lead and support the effort. And so for them, they had both a lot of the, those, uh, if, you, if you were thinking back to that framework again, they, they were saying yes to a lot of the appropriateness questions in the sense that the system was broken. You needed multiple sectors involved. This wasn't just a health issue. It was health and education. Um, so they, they cleared those, those points. And then when they got down to the readiness factors, they also had urgency. They had champions. This was a community that actually had a pretty robust a philanthropic sector and a bald in uh, public sector. Uh, so you had uh, some financial resources beyond uh, just one dedicated funder. And you had um, kind of a track record of, of collaboration. So for that community in particular, the, these set of questions were, were particularly helpful and it showed them that we do have the ingredients in place and we do think that collective impact is the, the right approach to pursue. So that's that's one example, one example, and they're still, and they're in, the, still in the in their early their days, early days of, of uh, implementing that that work. But it's been encouraging to see um, how they went through a structured process to first reflect on these questions. The second community, which I'll just speak to br briefly, but it does show you that not every um, social challenge and and solution should should necessarily use collective impact. This was also in California, also a community that was interested in focusing on preterm birth, uh, this was a community where they had a, a preterm birth rate that was um, actually below the state average. It certainly impacted a certain part of the population greater than the kind of average. So they were really focusing not on the entire community, but on a specific geography. And it was really a geography that was served by, by two or three um, organizations that really just needed to better coordinate and align their uh, supports for, for um, women who were at risk for preterm birth, um, and so where they ended up landing on, because the issue was still important, it actually did not reach a scale of urgency for kind of citywide or countywide. Um, it also was more of a function of several organizations needing to better partner. It did not require a cross-sector approach, at least to serve this specific high-need population that really, again, was, was being... Um, uh, focused on and served by, by two or three organizations. It was more about improving coordination among those, those few nonprofit partners. Um, so they decided actually to not form a steering committee, to not go through the process of raising funding and, and identifying a backbone. And I think that was actually a good outcome. They didn't need to layer on the process and structure of collective impact if it was going to be focusing more on a more effective partnership between two or three organizations. That's really interesting. Um, it is interesting to see how, you know, actually using the feasibility framework with kind of fidelity can lead you in a direction that can be helpful to your, you know, your collective impact effort or not, you know, because in the second example, you really um, provided us with a kind of an understanding that, you know, it wasn't required, it, the work that it would take to uh, move forward in a collective impact uh, way wasn't actually required for that community to achieve outcomes. So the next question that we have, um, Robert, is around the kind of preconditions of collective impact. So as you noted, when we looked at the feasibility framework, the bottom um, four set of, uh, the bottom section of the feasibility work really focuses, I think, largely on the preconditions of collective impact. And so why are the preconditions so important at the feasibility stage? Thanks, Liz. Happy to talk through that a little bit more. And I'd love your thoughts, too, Liz. The expertise on this call is certainly extends to, to you and the work you've done. So I'd love your, your uh, thoughts on these uh, preconditions, too. So, yeah, let me, let me just speak to them a little, a little bit more detail. So influential champions and supportive leadership. I would say the important point here is it's plural. So ideally, you're not 
Um, it's not just one person that's really beating down people's doors saying this is something that we need to work on collectively. This issue is, is too complex for one organization or one leader to take on on its own. I, there's this specific bullet about government leadership is engaged. That doesn't mean that government has to be championing it, but I have found efforts where you might you might just see it being um, kind of championed by nonprofit leadership or by philanthropy, by private funders. And that's a great place to start. But I would say um, pretty early on in the work, I've seen efforts um, you know, look for ways to, to bring in government um, leadership on a steering committee or on working groups just to make sure you've got that cross-sector representation. So that's that's one point I'd make there. This availability of resources one is, is a, an important one. It's certainly of these four, probably one of the most challenging that if you were to you know do a high, medium, low across all four of these, and you were to ask, you know, a hundred different communities, my guess is that this will be the one that would score closer to the low to medium scale. And that's okay. I think that that's common. We see that a lot, that there's oftentimes not as many funders that are willing to provide multi years of support for backbone infrastructure, for the, the work of the partners working together. Uh, but, but this is, you know, you're talking about complex systems change. This is not going to be solved in one year. And so ideally you do have funders that see the need to work together toward a common agenda over multiple years. And that requires resources, not just resources for, for meetings, for facilitation, but resources for the high quality programs that all the partners are doing that are, are going to be better aligned and more effective by working together. Uh, so that's an important one. And, and the, the framework set for at least 12 months, but I, I added this in parentheses and ideally for multiple years, so that it, it is, you know, again, more than a year typically. This history of collaboration point, um, this one is maybe hard to put your finger on sometimes, but I've definitely been in communities where you can definitely just feel it in the air that there's mistrust or burned bridges, or maybe there was a, a prior collective impact effort, or maybe it wasn't a collective impact effort in name, but it was a collaboration that spectacularly failed. And so that could have, you know, um, left a bad taste in people's mouth. And so being mindful of that going into a uh, a new collective impact initiative is, is certainly important, and to be mindful of the fact that there's probably existing collaboratives that you should build off of. You should work to um, celebrate and align the work of, of what you're doing, and not um, paper over or cover over the great work that maybe others have already done before you. And then I mentioned the urgency for change piece, and then that example about the two preterm birth. Um, efforts, there was more urgency, frankly, in the, the first community that I described where the, the preterm birth rate was higher than the, the state average. It, it was impacting a, an even wider um, number of of uh, mothers in that community and uh, mothers and, and their babies in that community. And so that was just an example where it, you, know, you, you would want to see that this is something that the community recognizes as a challenge and that there's a frustration with status quo and a, a, a desire to do something differently. Liz, what would you add to these? You, how have you seen these play out in your work? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of the availability of resources, we often will talk not only about the financial resources and having a conversation about what it will really take, you know, to do this over multiple years, but also the availability of human resources, right? And so if you're and it, that connects somewhat to influential champions, But I think, you know, Collective Impact provides an opportunity to bring in different kinds of human resources at different points in time as it, you know, scales up. So I would I would think about resources from both a financial and a human resource perspective. And, you know, um, Robert, increasingly, we're also seeing in terms of the history of collaboration um, communities that have multiple collective impact initiatives going on at the same time. And so I think you probably want to also pay attention to that. Like, is there space for the the it that you want to work on or does it fit into something that is already going on? And so those two, I think, are really critical um, to consider in addition to the four here or there are additions to the four here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those yeah, are very have, great additions. Yeah, if you have lots of collective impact initiatives going on in a community, it sometimes sometimes takes up a lot of the space and a lot of the in- attention of folks, and it's harder than to kind of find your 
your footing in uh, in that kind of a situation. Yeah, and I know before we go to your next question, it, it relates to where we'll go next about where I first stumble, but I would just, just want to add a finer point on what you just said about needing to align initiatives or be aware of other collaborators that are out there. I would say that that kind of the proliferation of or explosion of collaboratives that are calling themselves collective impact initiatives has certainly led to some people saying, if I hear that word again, I'm going to scream or, you know, I think in a lot of communities, it's been overused and sometimes wrongly, sometimes people are using it as a, you know, find replace the word collaboration and call everything collective impact. But I would say more substantively, when you actually do have collaboratives that are bumping up against each other, um, that can create a lot of problems if you're not very clear about, you know, what the boundaries are in terms of the problem you're trying to solve, the geography you're trying to serve, who the partners are that you're inviting to to be involved. Because like you said, Liz, they might be sitting on several other planning tables. So you got to be really mindful of that. Yeah. And, you know, the final thing I, I, I want to kind of um, share, uh, Robert, around the urgency for change um, that we talk a lot about with um, uh, collective impact initiatives in Canada is really to pay attention to your community narrative. Because sometimes you might think your issue is really urgent and it's urgent to you as, a, you know, a context a content expert, but it might not necessarily be urgent to the community. And so really kind of understanding how to communicate the issue, the relevance of data in that one embedded in that um, that kind of precondition, um, and understanding the community narrative, I think, is it are, are all really important factors there. Mm. So now let's move on to our next question. And um, it goes to uh, trying to think about where collective impact efforts have stumbled when they've not focused on you know, either the framework or the elements of the framework. Um, can you maybe share a couple of examples and how uh, groups might navigate their way through this? Happy to do that. And I love the image that uh, your team used here, Liz, where you've got someone stumbling, but they don't stay on their back. They get back up and they keep uh, they keep moving. So happy to talk through some of the, the challenges that I've seen collective impact efforts face. Um, but you know, I think the encouraging thing is that you can learn a lot from where you might stumble. Do actually go back a slide just so that as I'm talking through these uh, people can be reminded of them. So I think where I've seen people struggle on the or stumble on the influential champions piece is back to what I had said before. I think that where you could stumble is if you have just maybe one really vocal champion, um, but it's not something that the multiple champions are excited about. Um, I think that's probably an area where I've seen a lot of challenges or you've got champions that I mentioned before within one sector, but not across sector. So that's, that's a common area of challenge with that dimension. I think the, um, the availability of resources, as I said, the multiple, uh, having a funder that can um, see the value of multi years worth of funding or making sure that you have maybe funders that can come in at different levels. So I think where communities often stumble is you might not have a really robust um, base of philanthropic support. So how are you bringing um, government funding in? How are you bringing potential business support in? So being more mindful of different sources of funding for individual organizations and for that, that collaborative process. And I think where, particularly where people stumble on the, the resources for the backbone in particular is that there could be a misperception that the backbone is going to kind of suck up all the resources or people don't understand that it's 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 more of a, a leveraged investment to, to drive more resources for other partners. But I've, I've definitely seen it go the other way where people assume that the backbone is a power play and is gathering all the resources. So that's a, another area where I've seen efforts stumble. Um, I mean, Liz, you, you talked about the history of collaboration point and um, made some good points there about where efforts made, might stumble around aligning different collaboratives or where there might have been broken trust. Um, and I liked your point, Liz, about the urgency piece, that it might be urgent for your, um, for you individually or for your organization, but is it, is it truly urgency that's, that's broader than, than maybe what you perceive uh, within your work? I think that is certainly where I've seen some efforts struggle, or they may just say they, they think there's urgency, but they don't have data to back it up. So I'd say that's another area where you, know, you need to be more airtight in how you 
to find urgency, and that's both qualitative and quantitative data that's from interviews, from you know, data from public and private sources and things like that. Yeah, I think you're right about those. And I think there are really important points to think about, you know, um, doing due diligence in terms of thinking about your readiness to move forward. So um, here's maybe a little bit more of a tricky question. But given the breadth of collective impact efforts that you've seen, um, what additions or changes might you make to the feasibility framework to improve outcomes for um, these efforts? What what might you shift or change or add? Hmm. I mean, one thing um, I had noted this beforehand about you know potential tweaks to the precondition around resources. I had initially said we we, we probably need to be more explicit in there where it says twelve months. But we've had several conversations internally before about needing to be more explicit that that's that's ideally two to three years. So it. It may sound like just a wordsmithing thing, but I think it does it does signal something differently to say this is a multi year um commitment oftentimes so that people know that going in. So that that would be one is maybe it's just adding some more language about um the importance of having different types of funding over multiple years, um, and just recognizing that this work takes takes a, a long time, but but is worth it. The balancing the, the kind of financial realities with the the, the payoff. Um, I think another one, which is it's not clearly called out in here, but it's super important, regardless of what stage you're in, is just thinking about um, the role of the those with lived experience, thinking about the the, the people you are ultimately trying to serve. It, you could say it, it falls within that kind of history of collaboration, but I think sometimes people, when they approach collective impact readiness, they they just have that conversation among. Um, the other quote unquote professionals in the system, and they don't actually think about um, is this an issue that is of great need for the intended beneficiary? So it relates to kind of history of collaboration and trust. It relates to the urgency point for sure. So, how you assess, you know, is there trust and is there a history of collaboration? Is there urgency around the issue? It needs to really extend beyond just how the the folks whose day job it is to think about those things, but also those who are living it. And so that, I don't think it, it's hard to, to reflect the importance of equity and community engagement in a, a decision tree, but I think that's an area that's, you know, frankly not called out in here that we, we know for sure is super important, both in the early, mid, and late stages of, of collective impact efforts. Yeah, I might almost add that point into the influential champions, right? Because I think so often... Mm only think about influential champions as the kind of positional champions. And yet, you know, if you're working on educational outcomes, there's influential champions who are students who are doing well in that or teachers or others, you know, you kind of got to broaden your perspective of what an influential champion looks like, given the topic that you're trying to um, advance. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point, Liz. And I, you know, one of the other criticisms I hear of collective impact is that it can take on a, a top-down, a, a very, very top-down orientation, where it's just the executive directors of nonprofits and the heads of the school district and others getting together and kind of deciding for the community what is needed. And ideally, you're going to have an el- some elements of grass tops, but, but, but almost um, more importantly, or truly more importantly, that, that there's there's grassroots energy and excitement around that, and, and you're not just kind of bringing the community along after the fact. So easier said than done, but I think it relates to what you're saying, Liz, about those influential champions aren't just those in title. It's those who who are in the community who probably have, you know, such strong relationships and networks and, and knowledge that they could bring to the work. Yeah. So I have one more question before we open it up. And so for those of you that are listening, please do write your questions in the chat box so that um, we'll get to them in a minute. Um, But my final question for you, Robert, is what advice do you have for collective impact efforts that are in the earlier startup phases of their um, work and particularly related to the, you know, to that startup phase and maybe even to the visa to implementing the feasibility framework? So what advice do you have? Uh oh. Have we lost Robert? Sorry, Sorry about oh, that. No. Can you hear me now, Liz? Can you yeah, hear me I now? can. 
Okay, great. I was just saying, I want to turn that question back to you in just a minute, but I'll say just two quick things. One, um, make sure you assess appropriateness before you assess readiness. And by that, I mean, make sure the collective impact is the right approach, that it needs to involve multiple sectors, that it involves different um, systems that need to be coordinated, that it's long-term and, and orientation, and don't um, apply a collective impact frame to um, maybe um, effective partnering between a few organizations, which is needed, but you don't need a collective effect approach for that. So that's one. And then the second one I would say is don't feel like you need to be 100% um, on all four of the prerequisites or those readiness factors. So you might have strong urgency and strong champions, but not as strong resources. Um, and that's okay. So I would just, I wouldn't want people to, to, to see those four categories and be like, well, we're, we're you know, we're not 100% on all four, so we should just shut it down. So um, it's very common that I've seen that you might work your way into it and maybe you're strong in two or three of them and not as strong on, on the fourth. And part of the work together is to find ways to strengthen maybe the areas where you're, you're not as strong. Yeah, I think that that's really good advice. I think it is to kind of do your due diligence in terms of really trying to identify, you know, is this the right approach? Do we have a complex issue? And are we trying to move the needle around the complex issue? And then, you know, really understanding those um, those preconditions. I, I often say when I talk about collective impact that the preconditions haven't gotten the attention that they truly need, but I, I think that they are really important. Um, the The final thing that I might add, Robert, is that, you know, particularly around um, adequate resources to think about um, different kinds of resources, right? So for sure, uh, funding, but to stagger your funding as well to say, okay, so let's not just have one funder, let's have, um, you know, multiple funders that are investing in different kinds of ways and in our initiative. And that helps kind of create some of that resiliency as well over the longer term, if you're thinking about a, you know, a three to five year initiative. So thanks so much, Robert, uh, for sharing your wisdom. Um, we now have the opportunity to open up the floor, and you can ask Robert any specific questions that you might have. As a reminder, if you've joined us online, you can write your questions in the question box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can tweet um, questions using the hashtag Tamarack Connect. Tamarack Connect. Um, so I'm going to ask Duncan to uh, let us know if there are any questions that have been um, sent forward from the the group of uh, participants on the call. Hi, thanks, Liz. Uh, lots of great questions coming in. Uh, the first one is from Tony, and he said, at a practical level, um, how do you uh, how would you describe the kind of ideal situation for between the for profit for profit sector and the nonprofit sector working together on an initiative? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to share an example. I think it, I've, I've seen the, uh, the role of the private sector has been, and the role of the business sector in particular is, has been bubbling up increasingly as a, as a question that we're, we're getting a lot. It was one of the themes of our 2017 collective impact convening, which is our, our annual fuel like convening. We, we, put it on the, the short list of topics a couple of months ago because we have been getting lots of questions about that. And we've actually surveyed our online community. We've got about 20,000 people who've created an online profile. And we asked people, um, you know, how are you engaging different sectors? And the, the private sector, the business community is the one that's the least engaged, not surprisingly, in collective impact. Uh, but there are definitely examples where we're seeing the business community at the table, and ideally, they're at the table because it's a, a social issue that that connects in some ways to their business. So I can give you a couple of examples. One would be we've done some um, work and had um, leaders from Campbell Soup Company speak at um, some of our events, and they uh, have been investing for multiple years in a collective impact effort focused on healthy eating and access to foods um, in their um, hometown where um, where they have their headquarters. And they're not just doing this to get the TR benefit. I've, I've, as I've gotten to know their, uh, some of their leadership on their, their foundation, they actually see it as um, they, they have business um, assets and expertise that they want to bring to that issue. So they want to make a difference in the community, but it's also something that um, is core to making their headquarters town an attractive place to live and work. And it's, um, it's where they have the ability to engage their 
employees around an issue that that's of of um, you know deep concern and, and of interest. So that's that's one example. I've definitely seen other examples where maybe in something around workforce development or even on the like cradle to career education side, where it's the future workforce where a business would not just be invited in because they're a big employer and it's the right thing to do for the community, but they actually see this as a as an effort that that will um, help improve the the kind of pipeline of quality talent long term. So those are some of the ways that I've seen businesses engage is if they're able to kind of see how this work collaboratively will will either allow the, the business to bring its expertise, but ultimately will benefit the business and its work. Liz, what have you seen? Yeah, I think it's a it's a similar kind of pattern that I've seen, and I think it's really, you know, also up to us. Um, who are maybe not in business to really kind of think about what's in it for them, right? And and to look around our community and identify who are some of those um, business leaders that have engaged with, you know, organizations like United Ways and community foundations and other organizations and then try to say, you know, do you think that some of them might be interested in the issue that we're interested in? A, a really good example of business engagement was um, when I worked on the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, we engaged the local newspaper and they played a pretty prominent role, but it was clear, you know, they would say that, you know, that they, uh, their job is to track the stories in the community. And this gave them, you know, an opportunity to cover some different kinds of stories Um that they wouldn't necessarily always put in their newspaper. So, you know, I think there's a real opportunity to think about the traditional businesses, but also some of the non-traditional ones that exist in your community. One other real quick thing I'll add, and I know we want to get to other questions, is I've, I've also seen sometimes companies engage, even if it's a social issue that doesn't connect to their business directly, but they have um, team members who have expertise in things like continuous improvement. So I'm thinking about like utility companies or other manufacturing companies where you might have expertise and how to gather data and learn from it. And that can be tremendously helpful for collective impact efforts. So that can often really motivate people to get involved, even if it's not an issue that matters to the business overall, aside from them being a good corporate citizen. Uh, But it it is a way to, to kind of tap into employees' expertise. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Derek, and uh, they're asking, is part of the feasibility process actually understanding the systems that produce social problems themselves? I think it's a great question. I, I would say yes, and oftentimes I didn't I didn't talk about this, but sometimes we've seen uh, communities actually go through a two to three month kind of appropriateness and readiness process where they might actually have um, someone locally who, at a university or within one of the partners, or they'll bring in a facilitator to actually go through a structured process to better kind of understand the systems that are or are not interacting together. Well, they might, there, there are people who have expertise in system mapping where you can visualize connections between actors. And sometimes that, that process can actually be really helpful in that first couple of months to better understand when we say, you know, is the system broken? Well, that's just not going to be a yes no question. You're going to have to have data that that would back that up. And so um, sometimes it can be helpful to actually do interviews with different providers and with different um, you know folks in the community, not just the quote unquote leaders and title, but those in the in the, that live in the community that to understand um, how they interact with the system and to make that that concept less nebulous and more concrete. So yes, I think it is an important part of the process and. I uh, definitely, you're probably not going to answer this question in one 30-minute conversation with five partners around a table. It's going to require some structure and, and thought to how you bring other people in and how you look at the data to, to assess kind of where to go next. Well, thanks for that answer. Our, our next question is from Alexandra. How can we reinvigorate collective impact initiatives that have been operating for a number of years? Well, there's some great resources that um, Tamarack has developed, and we've, we've pointed to, Liz, maybe you can talk to a little bit around the uh, the key factors for leadership sustainability. There's also some great tools that Tamarack and others have developed on kind of identifying where there might be traps or places in, in the, the collaborative journey where you might get stuck. Uh, Liz, do you want to speak to that and maybe also just highlight uh, for, for that person in particular? I know there's a lot of great resources that they could, they could access to, that would get a lot more information. 
Yeah, we'll for sure um, add in our sustain, uh, sustainability framework in the post um, webinar email that uh, we've been working on for a number of years and have been informed by a number of collective impact efforts. But I think, you know, um, Robert, we see a pattern, and I'm sure you do as well, of um, a three to five year cycle in this work. And, you know, uh, there are two kind of entry points. Sometimes, Collective impact efforts go a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, that's really about building broad-based support. And then in the next three to five years, they go really deep on a couple of issues that they think they can get quite significant action on. And um, we also see the inverse of that pattern where, you know, some collective impact efforts come in and go very deep on one issue or two issues and then go wide in their section. I think... I think it is important to kind of know how you sustain not only some of components of the work, whether it's the influential champions or, you know, the funding over time. Um, so all of those things have to be paid attention to, even uh, community responsivity, right? Because sometimes the community is really with you and really excited about the direction that you're moving in, and then they move on to the next thing, um, as a lot of communities do. And then you've got to figure out, okay, so how do we re-energize this work um, by maybe going deep on a couple of issues that are really where we think we can get some traction. So, so those are the things that we, the patterns that we've been seeing and the way that we've been thinking about it as well. Wonderful, thank you. Our, our next question is from Kathy. Um, as a member of the Backbone staff for a CI initiative, how do you effectively facilitate sometimes inequitable power dynamics that surface? Yeah, it's a, it's a great one. There's, um, <clears throat> there's some good uh, resources that our colleague Paul Schmidt has um, shared on, you know, kind of how to facilitate a difficult conversations, how to set the table, and it it can be everything from literally how you how you physically set the table, how you set where people are seated, how you signal um, who is speaking and when. So it's not always in this formal like this person who's in a leadership role always speaks first. So there's things that you can do in terms of sharing, presenting, and facilitation responsibilities um, that I've heard Paul, my colleague Paul Schmidt, talk about. The other thing that I've I've seen is um, there, there's things that you do in a meeting, but almost more importantly are the things you do before a meeting to identify where there might be tensions or power um, differences and address them either individually or with the, the two or three people that might have had some concerns and, and recognize that some of the, the challenges, if you just leave it to work itself out in the context of the full group meeting, is, is oftentimes not the best place for that to play out. So it's it requires all artful facilitation in real time, and there's ways that you can set the room and, and design the agenda to accommodate that, but then there's also the things you do before and after in terms of follow-up conversation. This next question is from uh, Larissa. How can we use the feasibility framework or CI concepts to explore whether the preconditions are met or aligned before even starting a collective impact initiative? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to take that. I mean, I mean, one thing you could you could think about is is having those questions on that feasibility framework serve as a you know feed those into an agenda for an upcoming conversation. I mentioned before that you're you're probably not gonna answer them in one 30 minute conversation, but even if you're just trying to kick the tires uh, and you want to you know have a brainstorming conversation with a few partners, you could certainly use some of those questions as a starting point, and it might help you identify, oh, this is, um, there's a lot more we need to explore here. Let's actually spend more time and widen the circle of who we get feedback from, from other partners to better understand those readiness factors. So I think that's one thing that I've seen people use the framework as it's a helpful thought starter. It's not meant to be a, a, a rigid roadmap that if you follow these, can answer these four questions, you're, you, you can go, but it, it can be helpful to think about these um, questions and you could certainly have them be a starting point for discussion that you could then broaden over time. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a, a great question here from Crystal. Uh, in a small community that typically sees the same members at many different tables, 
Uh, do you have any suggestions for reducing member burnout when it comes to CI initiatives? Yeah, there's some, there's some great resources that the uh, Forum for Youth Investment has written on kind of how you align different initiatives, how you think about that issue of overtapping the same people. Um, so I can share that link uh, back to you all to, to circulate to everyone that might help answer part of that question. I mean, some of the things that the Forum for Youth Investment talks about is, and I'm sorry if you're hearing feedback, I don't know if that's on my line, but um, one of the things I've seen that um, that efforts have done to reduce burnout is to look for ways to potentially share working groups or to look for a governance structure that might actually build off of existing tables. Um, that doesn't always work well, but there definitely are examples I've seen where it might make sense if there's already a really strong data team that's working in another collaborative, can we avoid having two different data teams? Um, Sometimes that doesn't work if you're working on completely different issues, but particularly if they're adjacent issues, um, that can certainly help. Another thing that I've found that can give um, people life within the context of a collaborative is to have opportunities for kind of joint learning and sharing across collaboratives. So I've seen kind of cohorts of backbone leaders in particular meet up like monthly or quarterly, and you don't want to just have another meeting for meeting's sake, but if you can actually use those as meetings to problem solve and support each other, that can that can give a lot of life. And then I guess the last thing I would say is, um, you know, oftentimes these efforts burn out if there's not a lot of um, clarity on like what you're ultimately driving towards. So if you're able to not only get some quick wins, but get people line of sight into what you're ultimately, ultimately driving towards, then that can get people excited too. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Kelly. Um, although you mentioned that you don't need to be 100% on all four prerequisites, uh, can you comment on when there's a lack of history of collaboration uh, with one of the sectors or actors involved? Sure, and, I, and Liz, I think you're probably back on too, so feel free to jump in on this one. But I think there's, it's, it would be rare to have, you know, um, 100% engagement and buy-in of every sector. I think it's often common that you would have maybe more um, initial champions from nonprofits or from government. And so I think the first thing is just to acknowledge that and, and recognize that it might take a bit more time to bring some of the other other sectors or bring other champions along. I mean, the things that um, one of the things that Liz mentioned, which I think can help, is if you're trying to bring you know, the business sector in, there's ways to invite them in to acknowledge their expertise or to highlight something that would actually directly relate to or benefit their involvement. Um, there's things that you can do to build trust um, just by being humble and honest about prior missteps. I've, I've been amazed that when someone enters into a space and acknowledges a lesson learned from a failure, just how strong that can strengthen connectedness and bond in a room, particularly if that's packed up with others kind of weighing in and, and kind of acknowledging that it's a safe space. And then there's things you can do to build trust by not always, again, back to what I was saying before, not always having the same voice, but, but sharing the um, kind of discussion floor with multiple people that acknowledges that you're you're trying to um, kind of maybe break down prior barriers uh, to trust. Um, those are a couple of things that come to mind. I think those are all really good suggestions. I think that um, I think that you have to pay attention to the relationship side of collective impact, because it is one of those things that is, you know, that's, I think, one of those um, uh, kind of counter-cultural things. We're always pushing to do the agenda, but we're not necessarily spending time building relationships. And I think in collective impact, when we're together for a longer period of time, we've really got to figure out, okay, how do we bring the relationships? How do we bring the trust into the room? And how do we bring that kind of personal commitment to the issue so that it's not just, you know, data informed, which it should be, but it's also informed by, you know, the commitment that people have to, you know, hoping for a better future for their kids or for, you know, the community or whatever that commitment is that they, you know, brought them to the table in the first place. All right, thank you so much for that. I think that just about uh, brings us to time here. I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank you again, uh, both Liz and Robert for engaging in this conversation. And many thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, your comments and questions have really helped to make this uh, a really thought provoking conversation. As promised, in a few days, we'll email you with the recording of this webinar, along with other material related to today's call. 
we also welcome feedback on these calls, so please do email Tamarack to let us know how we're doing. Uh, it's also now my pleasure to let you know about a couple of exciting learning opportunities we have coming up just around the corner. First, we are hosting our annual Collective Impact 3.0 workshop next week. Uh, this workshop is designed specifically for those who are leading a Collective Impact effort, uh, anyone who is part of a Collective Impact collaboration, uh, those in a CI network and wanting to deepen your Collective Impact practice, or anyone who wants to share their Collective Impact experiences through a tool, case study, or workshop. This dynamic learning experience will be led by Liz Weaver and Mark Cabage, who together possess a wealth of hands-on experience working with and supporting collaborative community change initiatives across North America. Registration will be closed soon, so now is your last chance to take advantage of this amazing learning opportunity. Also, this March, Michael Quinn Patton and Mark Cabage will be offering a one-day evaluation masterclass that will explore the principles-focused evaluation approach and demonstrate its relevance and application in a range of settings. This is a very special opportunity that we're thrilled to be able to offer. These masterclasses will be taking place in Toronto, Regina, Calgary, and Vancouver, and will have a limited capacity. So if you want to take your learning in this area to the next level, I encourage you to follow the link on your screen and register today. Lastly, in April, we're hosting a workshop in Kitchener, Ontario, all about asset-based community development with a focus on neighborhood development and community health. This will be a rare opportunity to learn from Cormac Russell and John McKnight, two of the world's top trainers in asset-based community development. Needless to say, we have some really incredible learning opportunities coming your way, and we encourage you to visit our website at tamarackcommunity.ca to get more information on each event. Thanks again, everyone and have a great day.